Welcome everybody. <clears throat> it's nice to be able to come together and do some loving kindness practice. And tonight maybe we'll do more of a compassion theme. And I thought I'd start by just saying a little bit about, you know, this, it's really a kind of superpower. And it, as I'm sure you've discovered in your own lives, it's a little paradoxical <clears throat> how, how we relate to suffering, our own suffering and the suffering of others can be liberating. And I think it really, that's not just specific to this part of life where we are relating to suffering, which is, as we all know, not a small part of our human existence. But I think it, uh, it, it reveals a basic principle about <clears throat> what freedom looks like. So we have a conditioned life, a life, a mind, a heart that's conditioned by the past. And uh, as we're learning, that ain't so pretty because a lot of our past conditioning, if we've done any looking back in history, we see it's just a lot of greed, hatred, and delusion. Wynne Fricky, my partner, a lot of you know Wynne, one of our teachers, of course, and she's been doing a lot of <clears throat> work on her ancestry, just sort of mapping it out. <laughs> and and I guess there, I, I'm not really into it at all, but uh, she has some online resources where you can really get specific information one generation back after the other. And just how much misery how many, even back in England, beheadings and tortures and, you know, and it, back then it, somehow it all got recorded and the church ledger or wherever she's finding the, the sort of information from. So it really doesn't matter if we look now, if we look in the past, but there is this truth of suffering. And uh, we, we get the first sense how healing and healthy it is to acknowledge it just when we realize how stressful and neurotic it is for us collectively to be in denial about suffering. You know how it is maybe in your family, family of origin, but you know, we're there's a lot of suffering, but nobody talks about it because people don't know what to do with it except to keep it somewhat or completely buried. And even though it might initially be a lot messier and seemingly more painful when it's on the surface and being acknowledged, there's also a kind of breath of fresh air. Well, these people are speaking the truth. At least we're talking about what's here. <laughs> Otherwise it can be a little crazy making when like as a child or any time, you know, we get a sense of what's here, but it isn't being acknowledged. I got a letter recently from a common ground, long time common ground person, a younger adult. And they were making this point, just how much they appreciate the teachings and the center and the community because otherwise they wouldn't really have the context that, <clears throat> excuse me, normalizes the kind of, just the pervasiveness of suffering. And it doesn't mean it's the whole truth. This is the thing about dukkha, but it needs to always be named or <clears throat> in the room because it, it affects how we understand everything else. You know, it's like part of what makes a walk in the wood, uh, a nice woods or a nice meadow really healing and pleasant is because of the truth of dukkha, that there's a lot of destruction. There are a lot of places that aren't in harmony like a meadow or the woods might be. So that's just really the beginning of understanding how it can be healing to 
make space, not just in meditation, but all life, all day long, make space for the truth of suffering. Not, you know, in this superficial way where we think suffering, pain is an enemy. I mean, it's totally understandable that we think simplistically that way, you know, there's good and evil. Pleasure is good, pain is evil. But, and I love this about <clears throat> the teachings of the Buddha, it's so, they're pr so pragmatic, like, how does that work, making pain evil? Like, subjectively, in your own experience, when we're in that frame of mind, operating from that frame of mind, how does that work for us? Because if it's common, if pain and suffering is common, and we turn it into a, the enemy and pure evil, well, then we're, we're going to live our life feeling pretty threatened. Because, you know, how long can we go before we're reminded of the truth of suffering? Can't turn the news on, that's for sure. <clears throat> can't call our friends, you know. We were sitting doing our work the other day, maybe yesterday it was, I can't remember, and a bird hit our one of our windows and was sort of stunned, but not, didn't die immediately at least. And so we, when was kind of more on top of it, just watched it and hoping that it would, uh, you know, get its senses and then be able to fly away. And so we were just letting it be there. And sure enough, our cat, which was outside at the time, you know, when who was watching it kind of had to turn away for a moment and uh, the cat gets it. <laughs> so Wynn has to run in there and run out there rather and, and get the cat away from the bird. And But just something as something the bird eventually died, but just something ordinary and simple like that it just reminds us, oh yeah, this is a world where life eats life, where birds fly into play class windows, where it's one thing after another. And like I said, it's not the whole truth, but it's really a pervasive truth. <clears throat> and so we start by realizing how good it feels to be honest about it and to be honest with each other about it. And then it doesn't end there. Then the next stage is when we've stabilized <clears throat> how we relate, how we are able to include the truth of suffering. We're not out of habit just making it the bad guy. But we, yeah, this is this happens. <clears throat> this comes with life. Then then we can discover that even though being close to suffering hurts right, with that sympathetic sense, oh yeah, this, even if it's not my own suffering, but even if I'm aware of your suffering, there is some empathetic sense, oh yeah, this, this is bad, what's going on with you, and I, and I care, and then we discover that wishing well <clears throat> isn't the same as feeling afraid of somebody's suffering or the world's suffering, when I wish well for myself, when I wish well for another person, that's actually a really, can be a really beautiful enlivening emotion. And that's really where we're going with the compassion meditation. It's really based on this insight that bringing awareness <clears throat> in a more and more honest way to the truth, there is suffering bad stuff happens, things are insecure, <clears throat> and I care, and I care enough that I can actually wish well. And I can actually, with some training, I can learn to abide in that mind, in that heart that cares and wishes well. And even though <clears throat> in that space, we're in a sense, proximate to suffering, we're aware of the suffering, we're not in denial. So we're feeling, actually, it's quite energizing, because it reminds us that whatever well-being we have is not dependable, right? That's one of the side effects of uh, compassion is like, 
we're grounded in the truth. There is well-being in life, but it's not dependable. It's there and then conditions change and it can go away very quickly. And we don't even know how that's gonna unfold for us or anybody. So we're in that sort of heightened, energized, enlivened state. And, but we're keeping in mind this very powerful wish. It's powerful because it's true. May your suffering be alleviated. May you be free. I know you're suffering. I don't know how this is gonna play out. I'm not in charge of your karma of causes and conditions, like how, what's gonna happen with your cancer or what's gonna happen with your financial insecurity. But I, I do sense this proximity of, of uh, you know, this empathy about your exposure and I wish well for you. And that wishing well, that sincere, real wishing well is a beautiful emotion. It isn't a heavy state of mind. And that's what we want to discover. And there's a real stability in it because I really do wish that you would be free from your suffering. And I really do wish, even if the circumstances that are difficult don't change, I really do wish that you find ways to relate to those difficult circumstances that are wise and loving and bring some ease for you. So I can be established and abide in that well-wishing with a lot of spiritual authority. Like, I don't have any doubt. I really do wish for your safety. I really do wish that the way things unfold, this pain, the suffering goes away. And if not, I really do wish the greatest, the deepest wisdom and love protect and guide you so that you relate to the difficulty in your life with as much skill as possible. Does that make sense? And that's, that's what makes a really good meditation object is body, heart, and mind. We can really get be, uh, behind the attitude or the view the meditation object, we can ground in it because it has this stability, like it's a place where the mind can abide and keep it, keep it going. And then once we are in that really wholesome place of wishing well for somebody who's suffering, include, it could be ourselves, remember, and uh, really connected deep, like, with an integrity, like it's everywhere. Yeah, I really do wish that your pain and suffering can be alleviated and that you can relate to whatever difficulty remains with wisdom and love. And that wish is in a sense unshakable. Then we can notice how that wish is beautiful, but it isn't actually in, in the end specific to this person. It's like, there's no reason for me to limit that, may you be free from suffering, just to name it simply. There's no reason that that good wish can't become more and more inclusive, more boundless, more expansive. Yeah, there are a lot of people suffering in a lot of different ways and not just human beings. May all beings without exception live in ways, relate in ways that alleviate the suffering in their lives. May the deepest wisdom and love protect and guide you. And that's that, you could say the last part of the practice, the meditation practice at least, is to really allow the compassion, the natural compassion we've discovered to become boundless and inclusive. And it's, you know, in a way it's, it's how we touch, you know, we think, we wonder like, what's it like to be a really wise, you know, saint or something like that. Well, get into a deeper state of loving kindness or compassion meditation. And you, we get a sense of what it might be like. We, it helps us imagine 
what it would be like to be a real saint if we could abide with that kind of heart or mind all day long, even when we're getting triggered. But it's, it's a real start to touch into that space for periods of time. It's like in, in Buddhist terms, you know, it's real self-esteem because we see something, it's not so much about me. It doesn't in the end feel that personal, but it, it, it says something about the capacity of the mind or heart that's, that really, in a funny way, impresses us like, wow, that was beautiful. And that was completely trustworthy and it didn't seem self-centered or self-serving. Wow, I trust that. <laughs> and we feel in a funny way, good about ourselves or good about life or good about the path. It kind of, in a way, brings meaning into our lives. Any questions about that overview before we stretch a little and settle in for some practice? I see, Robert, you left a note. Make sure when at the end of our guided meditation, Robert will send out wishes to people we care about. You might want to bring up your relative who's 101. <laughs> yeah. So if there aren't any thoughts right now, that's great. We'll have, to have time to talk together when we're done with the meditation, but feel free to stretch a little if you'd like. And then we'll <clears throat> just do our best to settle in. Yeah, I mean, it's true. <clears throat> Just let's take it from our point of view. Sometimes we do get upset when we're suffering. And let's say our partner, <laughs> you know, is fine and dandy. And, it, you know, there are times when we're really hurting. It bothers us that other people aren't hurting. Because that's the nature of being exposed to pain is one reaction to being overwhelmed by pain is to strike out with aversion. And so that may be the case. But we know, though, when, um, when we're really hurting, but we're not out of balance, we don't want our suffering or our pain to cause others pain. So um, we're not doing that person any favor and we, and we might actually be causing them harm if their suffering is making us suffer because then their experience is I'm really suffering. I don't have a lot of resources to deal with it. And then I notice my good friend over here is really suffering because I'm suffering and I feel somewhat responsible and I don't want them to be suffering. I'm having a hard enough time dealing with my own suffering. Please don't make me have to deal with your suffering. So I know you didn't say that, Joan, but that gives us confidence like, and we're not like rubbing our well-being in their face, right? What are we doing? We're modeling being a sensitive human being. And because we're with them in that moment, or we're bringing them to mind at least, we're realizing, oh, life is not easy for you. My conditioning is to be afraid of your suffering. So my practice is not to be afraid of your suffering. And this is true if we're just bringing the person to mind like we might tonight in the sit, or whether you're actually in the room with the person. We're modeling being relaxed. So I'm sure a lot of you have had time to practice this. Like if you're around somebody on their deathbed or if you're around somebody who's in a lot of pain and you're <clears throat> one of their caretakers and there you are, what am I supposed to do? Well, you can practice not being afraid of their suffering. Now that doesn't mean we kind of neurotically want to help them because a lot of the time that's not helpful 
but being relaxed and being in our body and being aware of the exposure, like I'm actually afraid, part of the conditioning habit energy in my mind is to be afraid, almost like we think their pain is con uh, contagious. And so we, we have like a lot of, when people are helping somebody who's suffering, it's a, because they don't know how to just relax. Because part of what we're relaxing with is bad stuff happens and nobody's in control. And how do I know that? Because this friend of mine has bad stuff happening. And it, it's like reminding us this could happen to me. Not, not that we're even conscious of that, but I think that's part of what's in the room. So it's really, we have to see it's a real gift to relax. Now, that doesn't mean the person won't react to us, but that's their business. They're going to deal with their suffering, however they're going to deal with it. All we can do is be responsible for our, you know, like I'm just trying to be present. I'm not putting anything on you. If it doesn't seem helpful for me to be in the room, I don't, I don't have to be in the room. I don't neurotically need to be next to you. But whether I'm next to you or not, I'm going to practice not being afraid of the difficult place you're in right now. And I'm going to practice realizing I do have this wish that you get better. I don't know if you're going to get better, but I wish that you get better. And if you don't get better, I wish that you find the spiritual, emotional, psychological resources to relate to what's going on with a lot of wisdom and love. So there's some ease, even in these difficult circumstances. And I trust those wishes. And I don't think you, those wishes don't say what we don't tell us what we say to the person or how we act with the person, right? That can be because we're really relaxed, because we don't have any needs, relatively speaking, in that moment, then we can just let it be a creative act, like how we show up. And we'll just pay attention to like, whether it appears to be helpful or not, and learn and go from there. We don't have, we don't have to have a plan. Because sometimes the best thing is not to be in the room. And sometimes the best thing is to be in the room, even though the person on the surface, at least is acting as if they don't want you to be in the room. But you sense that they just need to rebel and kick and scream. And it isn't really about you. You know, it's just, we don't really know, but we can know where we're at, practicing not being afraid, practicing being connected to the wish. May this, may you find some space from this difficult place you're in. I think so, except the, the one sort of subtle tuning of that statement is, but it doesn't mean we tell the person that we're mirroring or that we even say anything. Because sometimes it may be an appropriate thing to say, but I think a lot of the time it isn't, but we're still doing that. You know, oh, instead of like, here, do this, it will make, it will help you. We say, oh, it seems like this is really overwhelming for you. Yeah. That's why it's a superpower to not be afraid of suffering. And it's really useful just in terms of these bigger issues, like in our culture now, as we're, it's just a little bit more uh, exposed, the truth of racism and other kinds of injustices that have been here. Um, but we're just at a time at least where it seems we're talking about it a little bit more. And with body cams, we're seeing some of the evidence a little bit more. And uh, same thing, like, to, like to see it as our job, our spiritual job, not to get tight. And I really work on this. Like when there are, the next thing is in the news, there's just a young man, I think in Texas, outside of Houston, maybe, with schizophrenia, but arrested for having some marijuana, African-American young man. And... Uh, yeah, and they took him to jail. Anyway, he he died in jail. 
um, and they had put a hood over him. It had, you know, kind of open, but it kept him from spitting. I don't know why they, they didn't say why he had it, but it's just like one of those very painful things for me to read. And uh, I really try to catch when my mind sees a news article, the headline and doesn't want to read it. Like, and I justify not reading like, I get it. I know this bad stuff happens, but I really then, it took me a while before I realized I was avoiding it. And so then I read it and it, you know, I get activated, but it gives me a chance to practice not being afraid of living in a world where this kind of thing happens. Oh yeah, this is how it is sometimes. This kind of ignorance, this kind of fear and hatred. Oh yeah. Can I bear witness like you were saying, Joan, to it? And we know, at least in our own hearts, it's a step in the right direction. Good, so let's uh, settle in and do some practice and we'll have more time at the end of practice. You might find it helpful to take a minute or two and do some mindful, deep, three-part breathing where you feel initially the lower part, where you feel the belly going out the lower lobes of the lungs, mid-chest, upper chest, and then a long, easy, complete exhalation where we take the time to empty the lungs without straining. Now make it enjoyable, this deep, full breathing. And in a way that's comfortable, lengthen it out. And we'll just do this for a few minutes. As if we have all the time in the world to fill and empty the lungs. And maybe one more of these longer, deeper, full breaths. Just enjoy the long exhalation when it comes and eventually <clears throat> let the breath continue on its own. And taking a little time, we sense the very real vulnerability of this body. There are different ways to tune into that, but just the simple need the body has for heat, for food, for water, for belonging shelter, we sense the beating of the heart and just the intelligence and resilience of the body, but there's also this natural aging process and other insults, other threats that affect the body. And we're just taking a little time and 
attuning to the truth of uncertainty and different things might come to your mind just like something challenging that's happened to a friend or one of your children or to yourself and we're just acknowledging something like anything can happen anytime. Part of what it means to be a human being is to be exposed to so many different, what in Buddhism we call causes and conditions, things playing themselves out. A distracted driver on the same road we're driving or exposure to COVID or whatever it might be. And so just allow somebody, could be yourself or some being, that for whatever reason, their exposure that you're aware of just resonant for you, for whatever reason. They're a simple, powerful symbol of the exposure to suffering. In the first part of uncovering this beautiful emotion of compassion is to realize I care and I care enough to learn how to be close, to learn how not to be afraid as I bring to mind what's going on with you or going on with myself. So we use our imagination, we use our memory, just to have a more of a felt sense of an empathetic sense of this person's difficulty. I care enough to be close, to honestly acknowledge, oh, it's not easy for you right now. And I care about that. I do care about how unpleasant, how scary this is for you now. And I care enough to wish well that even as I'm bringing to mind how it is for you now. I'm going to stay grounded in this real, this enlivening wish. May you be free from suffering. May wisdom and love protect you as you relate, as you do what you can. May you be at ease with these conditions. May you find your way. And you can continue to work with the first person, the first situation you brought to mind and just stay with it or you can bring to mind others. But really take the time, don't rush, take the time to feel that you can be close. And practice not being tight, not being afraid of the truth, the truth of vulnerability, the bad stuff happens, there is pain in life. 
And really practice connecting with that beautiful well-wishing. I really do wish that you find the deepest ease and clarity and skillfulness as you navigate this time. May the deepest love and wisdom protect you. May you be at ease. So let's continue in silence for a while. Be creative. We're keeping the quality of compassion in mind. And remember, it doesn't matter if what's showing up for you now is your own discomfort, your own anxiety, or what you imagine might be going on for another person. Because what we're actually bringing to mind is just the truth of vulnerability, the truth of pain, the truth of uncertainty. And we're learning to be fearless. It's not that we're not afraid even, but we realize running doesn't help. Denying doesn't help. Oh, this is how it is, and I care about that. I care enough to just feel what I'm feeling, knowing what's happening as much as I do, understanding as much as I understand. I care enough to be close and to be open and humble and to know to whatever degree that it's like this now for you, for me, for us. And I care enough to wish well. May you be free from suffering. May we all be free from suffering. May wisdom and love protect us and guide us. 
May we find a way to live with ease. Ease and well being. And you might find that after a while, you don't need to be bringing to mind a particular person or even your own suffering. And you realize how wide and deep this truth of suffering is. And we just do our best to trust that it's okay to feel the enormity, the depth and breadth of suffering. I care enough to be close. I care enough to feel whatever I feel now, even if it's numbness or hardness of heart. And I care enough to do my best to wish well for myself and for all beings. May we all find our way in this uncertain world where there really is so much injustice and suffering, hatred, insecurity. May the deepest wisdom and love guide us. May we be at ease with the conditions. And you can drop the words as well at any point and just practice resting and abiding and uh, boundless, tender, open-hearted compassion.
and we're learning to trust this beautiful boundless compassion we're learning to trust that it can shine or radiate out like a beautiful simple gift in all directions I care about suffering May all beings, all suffering beings, find their way. May we all be at ease with these changing conditions of our lives. May wisdom and love protect us. Again, we're doing our best to abide in this generosity of compassion. May all beings, may a particular person, may all beings be safe from harm. May wisdom and love protect all beings.
And feel the great confidence in that wish. May all beings be at ease. Feel the boundless love, the boundless compassion there. And just abide in that goodness. And the real art in this practice is to use whatever the mind needs to keep compassion in mind. But if it doesn't need that support, then to let it fall away. One thing I'll use is the chant we sometimes do. I'll just repeat it in my mind when I need that support. I will abide pervading all four quarters with this heart imbued with compassion. Above, below, all around, everywhere and every way, I will abide pervading the all-encompassing world with this heart imbued with compassion, abundant and boundless and measurable, free from hostility, free from ill will, I will abide.
And let's continue to hold the space, the meditative space for a few more minutes. And uh, sometimes it's nice um, just to give folks a chance to bring somebody who might appreciate our good wishes. We have that quality now having practiced some just easy to connect to the joy or sorrow that we hear people bring up. So if you know somebody or a group of people that are probably would appreciate being brought to mind and having our good wishes sent their way, then just unmute yourself and speak up. And then we'll pause after each person speaks for a few seconds and just let our heart respond naturally. And then another person can speak up. So anybody like to begin? Well, thanks everyone. And uh, you know, when people, when we do what we just did and people open the door, we realize it's really, um, I mean, this is, this is what it means to be uh, a wise awakened human being is like to have an honest relationship with suffering and not to be overwhelmed by it. And uh, I think uh, just to have a lot of humility around that. And, you know, of course, we only know what we know, but we can know that we don't know how the, the sort of great breadth and depth of suffering or in the places we're not personally connected with. And I have everybody we pass, you know, we're all, all the people here tonight, the, 23 of us or whatever, all of our unattended wounds that we're either partially aware of or not even aware of, because we don't get through life without those wounds, disappointments or whatever they might be. So it's a time now we can take a little time, 20 minutes or so. And I, as I often say at these Friday night groups, you know, We've learned, all of us, little or a lot, we've learned how functional love is to navigate our way as a human being and how impossible, really, I think this is true, how impossible it is to be a functioning, productive, whatever human being if we haven't learned a thing or two about how to access love, how to bring it up, how to abide, how to live through it. So this is what we normally do is just take some time and invite people like, what are you learning about love as a functional attitude, a functional lens, a functional emotion to live your life through? And of course, love has these different flavors. Like tonight, we've been talking a lot about compassion, but there's just that more basic friendliness of heart. There's that capacity to appreciate what is good and beautiful, call it gladness or sympathetic joy. And then there's equanimity, that vibrant balance of mind that doesn't care, that is okay when things are ambiguous or confusing, the balance remains stable as a kind of generous presence but it'd be nice to hear from people. What have you been learning? How are you able to access love in a way that helps you find your way in life? Or of course, any questions that come to mind about the practice that we did tonight or just generally about the practice. Powerful example of because it, it does seem like it would be paradoxical that going to see someone who lost a partner because of suicide just a week ago with your own experience of your brother's sudden death in your background, like that doesn't sound like a, a beautiful evening, but there it is. 
compassion is a beautiful enlivening, you know, state of mind for lack of better words. And we know that directly when it happens to us and indirectly when we hear someone like Jennifer share. Oh yeah, because we can sense the rightness that, yeah, that probably was an amazing experience. And just to, that's what, uh, you, we get a sense of the liberation that, well, that's always possible. It doesn't mean we can always be in that place, but it's possible whether it's a really beautiful moment and what creates the beauty is the mudita, that appreciative joy seeing beauty and appreciating it, seeing goodness and appreciating it, or compassion if we're around suffering, or just friendliness, or the radiance of equanimity, that enlivened, vibrant balance of mind. And just a sort of, you know, if we're going to vision, you know, we're always planning, well, why don't we aspire or vision just living with these enlivening emotions of compassion friendliness, kindness, appreciative joy and equanimity. Thanks, Jennifer. Who'd like to share or ask a question? What have you been learning about love that you'd like to share with the group? I don't have any, I think it's just a beautiful story. I mean, it, and that yeah, just that mystery of connection. And uh, I think in a way it lifts us out of our self-centered stories because it's not the story of what happened in that moment where the, the two of you appreciated each other, let's just say, mm -hmm. right? But it it kind of made a lot of stuff go away. That may be more what those moments are that were liberated from whatever stories that would otherwise be limiting the mind. And there's just that simple experience of consciousness appreciating, <laughs> you know, it's just, there's some connection. And as soon as we try to describe what it is, feels a little cheapened or something. <laughs> and one of the takeaways, just generalizing that learning is, I mean, I see this in terms of uh, arguments with my spouse, with Wynn. And if, if both of us or one of us can lift out of the entrenchment of the argument and just sort of connect, and then that's an invitation and you can kind of meet them. It doesn't resolve the, the argument or the problem in the relationship, but it just, it's a moment of dropping the weight or the self-centered seriousness about the argument. And so when we come back to the dynamic in the classroom, or in our case, the dynamic in the relationship, there's just a lot more light, light lightness and in, in how we're gonna creatively resolve whatever might need to be resolved. Thanks again, Jenny. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, there's all kinds of uh, more superficial things, you know, like uh, changing the subject, leaving, like in Jenny's situation, she'll never know whether being gone for that week, you know, what part did that play? But just how can we change the channel? Because a lot of times these grooves that we get in, in terms of interactions with another person, even if they're very destructive or unhelpful, there's a certain, you know, depth to that group and we get drawn in and it, our minds don't know what else to do, but do the same thing. A lot of us, and you know, we, I've been married now close to 30 years and it's like that in, in long-term relationships where we just kind of, we can, <laughs> we can kind of see that we're doing it. We know better and yet we're doing it anyway. Right? So, how can we change? Like as a Buddhist practitioner, the way to reboot is just to go to emptiness. You know, when we have uh, some momentum in our practice, we can just realize the self-centered 
view that we're operating with and the fruit of long-time practices, that self-centered fixed stance is nature, not self. As soon as the mind remembers that the way my mind is entrenched in this moment, it's like wisdom steps out of that space of entrenchment and looks at the entrenchment as, oh yeah, that's just how it is sometimes. It's nature, it's not me. Then that whole entrenchment can momentarily at least fall apart, pop, like a bubble pops. And then it's like a reboot. Now that person is still gonna be trying to do the dance the same way, but now at least we've unhooked momentarily. Now it's very easy, like I said, to get hooked again, the same way we got hooked earlier. But it, there's a moment of space where in that moment, our body language and what we might say or not say could be very creative out of the box that then could help that other person break their cycle too. But at the very least, we can break our cycle. And like I worked, I've worked in schools, you know, as a behavior specialist. So I'm very familiar with some of the things that Jenny was pointing to. And one of the things that's really important is like not to get irritated and uh, not to turn this into like uh, a struggle. So they may be in a struggle, but I'm not going to allow myself to be in that view that this is a difficult thing and I just got a few more days and then I get to go home, you know, I did my part. So to how can we be in a generous mode and a loving mode and a playful mode, not in a way that would be insulting to the other person, but like we don't have to play the game they're playing. They can play the game they're playing and we can't control that, but that's not the space I'm in. I'm choosing not to be in that space. But it takes a lot of moment-to-moment -moment awareness not to get pulled into the vortex, as you know, I'm sure. But maybe, maybe she really, uh, I mean, depending where she's at, maybe she really wants to grieve the loss of her life. And maybe that's really what's up. And, and maybe you can find a way to help her bring that to the surface. Oh, yeah, I'm it hurts, there's loss here, I'm losing everything. I wanna do that consciously because it feels better to do it consciously than to have life torn away from me unconsciously. So mm -hmm. let me consciously realize what's happening. I may not gain back functionality. And so can I participate? How can I wisely participate in the loss of old age? and dying. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we don't do a very good job of this. You know, we what we want to do is creatively help people have as much functionality. And I think there's definitely a, obviously a place for that um, with elder our elders. But there's also just as much a place to help them grieve the loss of their life because it's slipping through their fingers as it will for us. And it will be either quick or slow, depending on, you know, each of our circumstances, but it's coming. Mm -hmm. We should end it here. Really great. I appreciate people's mm -hmm. comments and sharings. It's so healing and wonderful to be together in this way. So I really appreciate everybody showing up. And of course, many things are going on at the center. Hopefully we're not all zoomed out and Shelley and I have been thinking that by June 1st, we'll start slowly bringing people back into the building. Of course, it depends what happens with the variants that are spiking in Minnesota right now. But for those of you out of town, we're going to continue to do programming online. So we'll probably have stuff that's just in the building, stuff that's just online. And we'll probably have a few things that are hybrid where we'll be in the building, but also broadcasting via Zoom or live stream. So um, our new community members who don't live in the Twin Cities will continue to have programs uh, so that you can be part of the community if that makes sense. So take care everybody, hope to see you down the road.